um, just a little bit about SoftTech. We're a very active micro-venture capital fund, so we focus on seed stage investing. I mentioned mostly consumer web and mobile startups. Um, and we're probably one of the early micro-VC funds out here in the Valley. Um, there's a number of other folks that kind of do similar things to us, but we're, we're bigger, than, we're bigger than, a, than, a, than a single angel, um, and yet we're smaller than a traditional fund. So, yeah. Can you translate that into the ticket side? I will do that. Okay. Yes. So um, just a little bit about our, our background and, and sort of what, we, what the fund looks like. So um, there are, currently we have three funds under SoftTech, one, two, and three. Uh, the first fund was actually just a simple super angel fund. It was our founder, Jeff Clavier, who um, is a pretty well-known super angel. He's on Twitter as at Jeff. And um, it was about half a million dollars kind of in and out of a number of companies. And we'll talk a little bit about how he got his start which is, like, which is sort of how you know, he built out his network um, to really grow SoftTech to where it is today. And then the second fund was still Jeff as the sole investor, but we did have outside money in that fund. So we had actually LPs, and it was a $15 million fund. And at that point, the check size was probably anywhere from 50K upwards to possibly even 200K per deal, um, but still relatively small bite sizes. And the real purpose of Fund 2 was about access into great deals. And that was really the first institutional fund for SoftTech. And now we're currently investing out of uh, SoftTech VC3. It's a $55 million fund. And our average check size today is around half a million dollars. So we'll do about one to two deals a month. So out of each fund, um, we've done, well, Fund 1 was sort of atypical. It was around 30 some odd investments. Fund two at 65 investments, and this current fund, fund three, will do anywhere from 60 to 65 investments as well. And in fund three, we have about half the fund reserve for follow-on, and so we do have a follow-on strategy of doubling down on winners. However, we, um, we really don't lead Series A investments. And part of the, 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 the thinking around that is that we're not competing with our friends at the later stages. In essence, we're a really great source of deal flow for them bringing them highly filtered, qualified deals. And we do, however, to exercise our pro rata rights and ideally try to get in as much as we can into those companies as we identify the real winners in the portfolio. And you know, that from time to time you're able to do that and then frankly there's other times where the pro rata just isn't available in order to get later stage investors in and, and, that, and that happens too. Um, to date we've done over 130 investments since 2004. I think we just hit 40, our 40th investment out of the current uh, fund three, later stage investors. And we've had over 1.25 in exit considerations. So uh, nothing in the portfolio has gone public yet, but we've definitely had some great exits, and that's on my next slide. So uh, some of these names look pretty, may look pretty familiar. Um, the most recent exits we've had actually don't, so out of our current fund, our first, uh, our first exit has been uh, Card.io, which was acquired by PayPal over the summer. Um, a couple other recent ones. I actually don't even know if this is completely up to date. Um, what about we just about Wildfire is probably the, the biggest one most recently, which, we, um, which was acquired by Google not too long ago. And that was a pretty exciting exit for us. And uh, go Victoria. That was, yeah, that was great. Oh, there it is. It's right, it's right here. So we've got oh, this a little. Yeah. I got this a little out of out of out of, out of ranking here, but um, so that was a big one. Uh, Bleacher Report also uh, just just exited as well. So that was another big one. It was acquired by Turner. So we've had we've had a number of pretty brand name brand name startups actually being acquired by by brand name uh, technology companies and whatnot. Um, and so obviously exit is exiting to an acquirer is one option. And, you know we'll talk about that as well. So here's a look at our, it's kind of hard to see on this, you can't quite see the grid, but here's a look at some of our current investments. And you know, what we, evolve, what we invest in as seed investors has evolved over time and will continuously evolve in terms of the areas that we find interesting to look at. And that's partially because the trends change and then what's, not necessarily what's popular to invest in, but really where the opportunity to invest will shift. So whereas five years ago, social media would have been a hot area to invest in, now it's much more tactical. It's something, it's just an element that all of our companies utilize. We can make the same argument with mobile these days. We, we still do a lot of investing in mobile, but mobile is a component to a lot of the companies that we invest in as well. So just taking a look at some of these, probably Fab is the largest one on here um, that many of you may be aware of. Um, we do a tremendous amount in e-commerce um, and next generation commerce, including not just traditional e-commerce, but also things like marketplaces. Um, 
Mobile enabled services and infrastructure is another big area for the fund these days. We're investors in companies like GigWalk and Postmates, um, companies that are really leveraging uh, the fact that everyone has this in their hand and can really transform workforces as a result. Um, and then the third area we spend um, a lot of time on is, is just is SaaS, both vertical and horizontal SaaS. So we're in companies like StyleSeat, which is an open table for stylists. We just did a deal last uh, winter in a company called Farmeron, which is actually uh, originally out of Croatia um, and split between he split their time between uh, the Valley and Croatia. And uh, it's, a, it's a SaaS solution for farmers, specifically focusing on milk farms and the data coming out of milk farms uh, to start. And so we definitely look for investment opportunities in uh, verticals that have seen limited uh, technology enter. And there's a lot of opportunity not only with cloud, but now with mobile. Um, and then one thing I'll point out that we have within the fund is opportunistically we've had this new areas, place to experiment. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I'm going to apologize right now. I uh, lost my voice about three weeks ago. And it's still just coming back. So my voice may come in and out as, as I'm talking. I was actually told by my doctor that I should only talk for money-making activities <laughs> because I use my voice professionally. <laughs> so I'm not really that, that yeah. this is it. Yeah, this is, this is a money-making activity. It's, it's a work-related activity, so therefore I can talk. Uh, otherwise, I've been told not to talk, um, which I'm not too good at following that advice. So um, new areas, a couple things to point out there. I think Fitbit's a really interesting investment for us. Um, I don't know if any of you have a Fitbit around the table, but it's a it's a it's a tracking you know tracking health tracking device. Um, they now have a scale. Uh, they actually just I think the the one is now available for purchase. It's the new it's the new updated version of the Fitbit in, in stores today I think. Um, but essentially you know connected connected devices and hardware is something we typically don't invest in, but liked the hardware software. Jeff did that a deal first back in 2008, um, so we we were early investors there. But really, we have this new areas as a way to opportunistically look at areas that we may eventually, over time, become their own category in the fund. Um, one area that I can point to where that's happened is education technology. So a year ago, we had, well, we just did our first EdTech investment. And it would have been, I think it still sits over in that new area. It's a company called Class Dojo, And it's, a, um, it's, a, it's an application for teachers in the classroom to begin to monitor behavior. And it really goes towards this broader play around the measurement of character, a lot of things that have come out of the KIPP school of thinking. And it's, a, it's got a very consumerized approach to entering schools. It doesn't rely on the school district or even the, the school level approving the, the application. It's something a teacher can download for free. Um, we have millions of students on it, hundreds of thousands of teachers are using it. But it was a new area for us to go into education. And certainly, it's a new area within education. Um, within the last year, we've done two additional ed tech deals, and Class Dojo was, was a way that we kind of got to really begin to get um, interested and begin to understand the space. And so since then, we've done a company called Top Hat Monocle, which is actually out of Toronto. And you know, you know it's actually one, one of my companies. Oh, to the great! At Rocket Space. Awesome. I was going to ask yeah. you next. How yes. Many of those companies are we have two Canadian. So well, I'll tell you which ones are. Uh, so we have two. Well. So Top Hat is classroom clicker, turns iPhones and, uh, and regular phones and desktop into ability to pull in the classroom, so focused on higher ed. And then the third investment we did in EdTech is a company called Clever, which was out of the most recent Y Combinator batch and essentially is an API for, um, for student uh, information databases. So essentially all the student data that resides in the database at the school, how do you get that easily in the hands of developers so that their applications can be used much easier by, by teachers and by parents. And so um, we've done three investments in a space that a year ago we had nothing in. And so I think, you know, and you'll, as, as you think about your angel investments and those of you who are running incubators, you will begin to see trends and things begin to emerge. We're constantly shifting our thinking and exploring new areas, but we still look for consistency in types of business models and themes that we understand as investors that allow us to kind of leverage what we've learned across the portfolio. Um, in terms of what's US versus international and, and, and geographic split, I think is a great question. Um, we have only a handful of international investments, and I would almost consider Canada to not, it's international for us, but it, it's, it's, it's still close enough. Um, so we have two investments out of Canada. We have Vidyard out of Waterloo, and, mm -hmm. um, and then, and I was actually in Waterloo not too long ago, and we have Top Hat out of Toronto, but they also have a presence here in San Francisco. Uh, we have, I think we have one deal here that's based in Europe. It's highly unusual for us to do a deal in Europe, that's Blink Booking. Um, 
we certainly don't. We, we you know occasionally from time to time we'll do a deal there, but we don't we don't tend to look for deals coming out of Europe. Um, and then for the most part, though, our seventy five percent of our portfolio is based here on the West Coast, split between small Mountain LA and then really just the Valley and primarily San Francisco these days. A lot of our a lot of the consumer tech has just moved moved slightly north from from where we are right now. And so that's the majority, about 10 to 15% of the portfolio is based in New York. And we continue to see interesting opportunities emerging from, from New York. We actually don't have anything in Boston and we have a handful of companies uh, based in Boulder. And traditionally when we think about how we invest outside of what we consider the local home market, which would be here in Silicon Valley, we look for building syndicates with strong local partners on the ground. So anytime we're doing a deal where you know, we're not necessarily down the street. We try to find local investors, whether it's an angel or another micro VC, who we know is going to be a little bit closer. And we think that's very helpful to not only ourselves as investors not being next door, but also to the founders themselves. And so that's, that's part of what we think about as we think about putting together syndicates and, and working outside of our home market. And um, you know, and, and that's evolved over time too. When we started out as a fund, all of the deals that, that Jeff did when he was a solo investor were based here. And then slowly over time, he started investing sort of outside of outside of the valley. And really, it was having friends in other cities that, that could bring us good deals and vice versa. So, any other questions I can kind of answer about the portfolio right now? Otherwise, I'll kind of dive into into the meat of the talk. So, basically, what we're going to talk about today is getting from starting and, and finding good deals to actually getting to close. And then if we have time, I added a few slides in here about portfolio management. I don't think there were a lot of, there was a lot of talk about that, and so I thought it might be just a little helpful to touch on some of those points. So I think sort of top of mind is how do you begin to attract good deals? And there's really two ways you can do it. You can do it the value-added way or the non-value-added way. So we'll talk in depth about the value-added way, and then if, if there is no intrinsic value to offer, we'll talk about ways that you can start to think about doing that. So. Um, the, first, the first way is really the value add way, which is to define your value add. Um, and what that means is, what is it that you've done in the past? Um, what, is, what, is, what is it that you're bringing to the table for the entrepreneur or for the company? And so it could be prior executive experience, it could be experience as an investor previously, it could be access to a network, a platform company network, it could be expertise in a particular operational area. But essentially, you want to really begin to think about it. What is, what is the unique thing that you're bringing to the table as an angel investor? What is it that separates you from others? What is it that you're bringing some unique insight that can be helpful to, to that particular deal and to the portfolio that you intend to build as an angel? Uh, one, one thing to do is really to hang out, network, and get to know and meet great entrepreneurs. And so there's a lot of hangouts. I mean, you guys obviously run one, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of great ways here locally, and if they don't exist in your local home markets, it's something to think about how you get together groups of people that are focused on entrepreneurship, that are really interested in um, getting to meet other entrepreneurs. Other entrepreneurs are great sources of deal referral. They're just different ways in which you know people network. And the more familiar you are, and the more people begin to see you at, at events, at speaking engagements, things like that, it's just <coughs> another way to kind of solidify yourself within the community. Okay. Another way that you can begin to, to do value to give value out of feedback before you actually get into deals is really try to be helpful. And that's listen to entrepreneurs give pitches, give some feedback. Try to offer to connect them to one or two individuals that can be helpful. Um, you may not be ready to invest, they may not be ready to take your investment, but really getting out there and beginning to be helpful within the entrepreneurial community being selective about the companies that you're helping, really making sure that you're helping companies in a way that they can, they can turn around and talk about the help that you're giving to them, even though you're not necessarily putting dollars in, you know, you're giving, you're giving your time right now. And that, that will come back. Um, most of the best referrals that we get um, as VCs are actually coming through founders. Founders in our network, founders whom we've invested in, founders who we haven't invested in, who just know us and, 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 and know our reputation. Um, and so I think, you know, Thinking about how before you have any dollars in a company, before you've actually begun even angel investing, how you can be helpful in a way to begin to build your reputation as someone who could be a good advisor. So offer to help. Um, another thing we have on here is hustle. It's really all about the hustle. Um, you know, getting into a deal means 
really selling yourself and selling the value proposition that you've identified. One of the ways in which we get into deals and can get into deals very quickly is, you know, people understand the soft tech platform and the brand and the value of the portfolio we bring. But we work hard to get into those deals. And um, so it does take getting your brand name out there. It does take, you know, getting out there, working hard to be known and to, to have others be able to talk about you and, and, and know a little bit about you and what you bring to the table. And so develop your reputation. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. There's, there's ways that you, you can, again, you can do that through advisory um, things. You can give, do it through giving talks. You can do it through drawing from your own personal experience and helping founders in <coughs> small settings to deal with specific problems that they're facing in their company. If you're an expert in marketing, can you, you know, begin to give talks around customer acquisition? Um, you know, a couple years ago, blogging was a really great platform for angels to begin to get their brand out there. There's a lot of people that blog these days. So, you know, it's sort of a, okay, you need to have some sort of online presence, obviously, but really think about the ways you could be different, the way you, you can stand out. Um, even if it's just, you know, small ways, you're not necessarily driving a ton of traffic to, you, to your site, but you have meaningful things to contribute to the broader conversation. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, I'm trying to read all of this from a, from a <laughs> distance, which I'm not so good at. And uh, so I may look behind me. And then finally, um, you know, again, it really is about building your own personal brand. What is it that you're doing that, that is consistent, that people begin to recognize when they hear your name, they know this, the three or four things that you're bringing to the table. And I think that consistency is very important. You can use a number of social media channels to hammer home that consistency. The companies that you begin to advise um, will, will hammer home that consistency. You know, one of the areas that I've spent a lot of time investing in over the course of the last, and looking at over the course of the last year and a half, in addition to education, has been next-gen commerce. And now when I meet later stage founders who, or excuse me, later stage investors who Series A, Series B, who don't necessarily, aren't ready to do the deal, the deals are too early, I'm, I'm actually one of the names that comes up quite frequently is, oh, you should, you should talk to Stephanie at SoftTech. SoftTech does that, does that a lot, and Stephanie actually looks at those deals. And so just getting out there what it is you're looking at, getting out there what those things that you're interested in and where you can actually have very value added conversations, whether or not you choose to do the deal, um, is, is very, very helpful. So it's really about, really just, once you've defined that brand, how do you then hammer home what that brand is? And then finally, building your track record. I mean, the first couple of deals that you do, think very carefully about. Those deals are deals that, you know, you will look back on and reflect back on as, as, as the foundation for the brand that you're building as an angel. And so whether you're, you know, an incubator, like looking for those one or two deals in that first incubator class that are really going to, to help you begin to show and to demonstrate to the next wave of founders in an incubator, this is sort of the bar. This is, this, is what, this is what we're looking for. There's a lot of signaling that obviously goes on within the portfolio. And, and again, as I mentioned, our founders are some of our best sources of referral. You know, we really, we, we, we really trust our founders. They're, they're people we've, we've given time and money to. And so therefore, when they come to us with a recommendation, we take that very strongly. OK, so the other way, if you can't exactly define your value add, and it sounds to me like everyone in the room doesn't necessarily have, have this difficulty, but, but if you can't define your value add, there, there are other ways to begin to, to get exposure and to get into deals. Um, one is just to align, your, align yourselves with other investors. And I would say, again, this potentially as other people that are there locally um, or other people that you know within your network. Folks that, um, that can actually help you get into a deal, um, you know, maybe you're just money on top of the initial money, so I'm just going to do a follow-on. I think it's harder to do that these days, particularly in areas that are crowded. Um, as you're talking about other markets outside of, outside, of, outside of here, outside of, I'd say, New York, outside of potentially hotbeds like Israel, you actually very well may be able to piggyback off of a lo another local investor's investment. So, you know someone locally who's putting in 50K, you say, I just want to follow on with, with 10K to, to your investment. And, that, and that's one way to begin to get into deals. And really it's about finding a mentor, finding someone who can help you begin to think about how to structure your own thinking as an angel, someone who can make introductions for you and help you again kind of get into that network. Again, I mentioned the shadowing investments. So, you know, finding one or two folks that have a solid thesis that you want to get behind. Again, I think it's easier to do in secondary markets as opposed to markets like this one. And then, you know, it's just about being a good person, right? Listening, learning, how do you complement what they're doing? And eventually, you're, I think you really do begin to figure out what that value, what that value add is. 
and I mentioned it's just it's tough to do the non-value added way outside of in, in in very hot markets. In new emerging markets, there's more of a need for capital period, and so there's more of an opportunity to lend capital and then begin to grow as an investor to add more value over time. The value you're giving is capital that isn't necessarily accessible in those markets. Oh, all right. Let's do a little bit of. Back up happening there. Let's see here. <laughs> there it is. All right, we're back. Okay, so any questions about attracting deals before I move on to the next? Okay. So I say once you actually get the pipeline and you begin to develop your funnel for great deals, you've got a great network, you've got a brand, um, and you really start getting your deal flow coming in, this is actually probably one of the biggest challenges you'll begin to face, which is how do you filter through? good deals. And I would argue this is probably one of the, the biggest challenges that, that we have at SoftTech um, in terms of, it's, you know, we've, we've got a great pipeline of deals now. We can't possibly meet and see every deal that's out there. Um, we can't possibly meet and see every deal that's been introduced to us. And so we have to really develop our filter. We've had to really learn to develop our filters over time. And I think that filter continues to, to evolve and grow as we grow as a firm. So first and foremost, you really need to have an investment thesis. And, and I talked a little bit about ours. We have a couple sectors that we look at. We have a bite size that we do a certain amount. We focus on seed stage. We also primarily have a geographic focus and a way that we think about investing outside of, of basic geographies. So a couple ways that you can, you can do this. You can have a sector focus. You can say, I'm only going to invest in companies that are enterprise software companies, or I'm only going to invest in uh, consumer mobile companies, or I'm only going to invest in next generation commerce, or I'm solely going to focus on marketplaces because I'm a marketplace expert and know how to grow marketplaces. And so you'll, you'll evolve thinking around a particular sector. Um, second is location, and, and that's a very, very valid way to, to segment deals. You know, if you, if you only do deals in, in Boulder, then you're not, look, and you only do deals, enterprise deals in Boulder, then you're not going to consider a startup based here in Silicon Valley that does that does you know mobile networking, right? So, you know, being disciplined about defining what it is you're going to look at, and then being cutthroat about not looking at deals that don't fit that thesis is is one way that you can begin to filter. It's also another way as you're beginning to build credibility in a space and to begin to be able to recognize patterns. You want enough leeway within the portfolio that you're building out as an angel that you don't have companies competing directly with one another. But at, this, and, and, but it's at the same time, you're going to want to be able to leverage what you're learning from one to the next to the next. And so I think it's really, really important to have that thesis. And again, that goes back to talking about that thesis publicly, having that thesis available um, on things like AngelList and on your blog and on your website um, if you maintain something like that. So we have a rule at SoftTech. There's the criteria that we use to look at our deals. We have something called the three asses rule. And um, it usually gets a couple of chuckles. Um, so there's three things that we say we look for in deals. And this is, a, this is our SoftTech rule. In fact, we've actually, I think we're now going to, we, we, this is, it's, you know, Jeff wrote a chapter in it, in a, uh, in, about it in a book. We talk about it on panels all the time. Um, for us, there's three things we look at. We look for a smart-ass team with a kick-ass product in a big-ass market. <laughs> and I, so I'll talk a little bit about what that really means for us, because I think, I think that's actually um, incredibly important. So, it, and, and, and the reality is you'll find your own way in which you, the, the criteria in which you look at deals, but these are the three things we always ask ourselves about every deal. And, and funnily enough, um, Jeff, Jeff, Charles, and I don't take meetings all of that often um, together. Most of the time, you pitch one of us one-on-one, -on -one, you pitch the next one, you pitch the next one. We actually like to do it that way. But once in a while, all three of us are meeting at the same time. And a couple, it was about a month and a half ago, founder was in our boardroom. And I think this is the first time this ever happened, and I just didn't make the connection right away. The founder was, was very excited to be talking to us, and, and he says, I really like your three asses. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, wow, that's really bold. And I realized he did not mean our three asses. He actually meant our three asses rule. Um, so, that, so there's a first for, for the way that the three asses rule can be interpreted. But um, so that's how we, we, that's our really quick criteria. And when I get a deck, 
I, I think about that. I look, I look at the founding team, I look at the market they're going after, I look at do they have a product, do they have a prototype. Um, additionally, the other criteria I would say we think about are um, right now is, is the size of the deal, how much they're raising. I think that's important for us. Uh, as an angel investor, that's a slight, the, the criteria will be slightly different. You'll still probably only focus on seed deals, but your threshold may be much smaller deals than would be our threshold. And we also do think about uh, follow-on and, and fundability down the road. So is it a really competitive space? Um, are there some, some in, uh, other competitive deals out there that have deeper pockets that, that may make it tricky for a later follow-on funding? Again, that's a different, as an angel investor, your, your outcomes that you're looking for are slightly different than our outcomes, so that will be potentially less of a concern for you. But let's talk a little bit about three assets. Um, so at the end of the day, team, the kick-ass, the smart-ass team is actually, I think, the most important component of what we're looking for. And you can sum it up as the three Ds. We look for design, we look for developers, and we look for distribution. So starting with distribution, distribution is the business, the business thinking. Um, it's the person on the team who's going to bring this, the business sensibility, who has an idea of how you will get um, out there in the market and potentially how you will monetize later. Um, design is obviously a really strong component to the product. How does the product fit? How does the user, how, how does that user experience look like? And then the third piece, obviously, is, is a development team. It's really difficult to invest in a team that doesn't have at least some technical experience in-house. It's rare that you find all three of these things in one founder. Typically, you're, fun, you're, you, you're looking for as much of this as you can in a founding team. Uh, I would say, for the most part, we, we like to see t uh, founding teams with at least two co-founders. We've definitely invested in solo founders before. We've invested in, in, in teams of, of three, maybe even up to four founders. Once you're, once you're getting above you know, three, though, it starts to get a little tricky in terms of the You may have a founding team, but really the, the co-founders are, the, there's only, you only can have so many people that are really, really leading the direction. Um, and again, it, it really goes down to limited resources. And my guess is that most of the deals that you, you'd be considering as angels, potentially there are just the co-founders at this point. Um, and they, they may not even have anybody who's outside of that team. But really what it comes down to is this team's ability to execute on the idea. Because this is the team that's going to get the deal that you're investing in to the next level. You're not necessarily bringing on any more senior management at that point. So really focusing on your ability to read that team and that team's ability to get out there, get a product in the market, learn what that product is doing in the market, make smart decisions. Um, that's what you're looking for. Okay. Um, so we'll, uh, before I go to that, we'll mention just a kick-ass product. It's a product that has a good fit within the market. We like to see a prototype. Again, that's the difference between an uh, institutionalized micro VC fund and even an early angel. An early angel may be okay investing in just concept, potentially just wires. We, we do like to see some semblance of a product. And again, that's a swinging scale based on the experience we've had working with an entrepreneur before in the past um, and the team what we know about the team's ability to build and execute. Um, there are times where we actually need to have a live product see users, not necessarily see revenue, but see paths to revenue before we're comfortable investing. And that will vary um, based, again, on the team, based on the market, and based on just uh, what's going on in the broader market right now. And then, you know, obviously the third piece. For us, we look for um, billion, at least a billion dollar opportunity. And, and that's because we want to know how that company gets to say $100 million in run rate, so 10% market share. It's not reasonable to expect that they're going to own an entire market, and so that's why that billion is sort of the minimum threshold for us. And again, as an angel, you may, you may be okay going after a deal that is smaller than that, um, but then the limit, there, there will be some limitation as to whether or not that's going to be a venture-backable opportunity down the road, but again, can still have really good exits from an angel perspective. Um, you know, and what we can talk a little bit about that that type of thinking a little later, but um, you know, so that's our threshold. And your threshold may be slightly lower; it may be slightly lower based on the market that you're operating in as well. But that's really how we think about things. Um, the next thing I have up here is ask domain experts, and and that's a really important one. You know, I mentioned we do one to two deals a month. We look at deals across a number of different sectors. Um, certainly, a lot of our investments deal in areas where we have, none of us have personally worked. So certainly none of us were farmers in the past. Um, so the ability to look at a deal like Farmer on, we understood the SaaS model, we certainly understand distribution, but, but did we have insights into what, into what, to what farmers needed? And so 
one thing that we do is we reach out to experts within our network, whether they are uh, founders in our current portfolio, whether they are people we've had business relationships in the past, people that we know that know more about a particular industry than we do. Because a lot of the time when we look at a deal, we actually are not an expert in that particular industry. And so we leverage our network to the extreme in order to get to understand a deal better. We're not necessarily looking for these experts to tell us, is this a good deal or not? What we're looking for is to understand the viability of the deal. Um, so if you're looking at something in the payment space and n not, none of us on the team are an authority within payments, we may need to know just base legality is what they're doing legal. Is, will what, they're want, what they want to do work from a technical perspective? Is this even possible or feasible? And so we, we actually leverage our experts in our network very much for questions like that. We make the determination about the end of the day as to whether or not the business is interesting to us as investors and a large enough opportunity for us to invest in. But we certainly leverage our network as a way to understand the viability of a lot of what the companies we're looking to do are. And I think those conversations can actually be very beneficial to the founders too. So you want to make sure that as you're connecting founders in the network to the experts in your network, um, you're thinking about how that conversation can be mutually beneficial. Because again, we all know founders have limited time. Um, and as do many of the people in, in your network that you're trying to connect. And so I think that can be an interesting opportunity of the conversation. And, and over time, you'll, again, you'll, div you'll figure out who those go-to people are who can quickly look and help you evaluate a deal um, from an industry perspective. At the end of the day, though, you know, one thing we like to do, one thing that I think is actually really important is, is sleeping on it. Is, you know, every, the, first, the first couple deals you meet, you will love. <coughs> they will all seem great. Um, I remember starting out, you know, and just you know, thinking every company, oh wow, this is such an awesome idea. And the reality is, um, it's 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 just the first few deals you're seeing. You know, you're you're limited in, in, in what your purview will look like in the very beginning. And so you'll develop that filter again over time. Um, you know, the first deal you meet is not the first deal you should do, and most most likely, <laughs> um, there's exceptions obviously to every rule, but. Um, at the end of the day, you want to ask yourself, do you like the founder? The reality is this is the person you're backing. This is the person you're going to get to know personally. You're entering into a, a, a significant relationship with this individual. And so do you actually like this individual? Do you want to sit around the table with this individual and help this individual build a business? And I think that's really important to ask yourself. Um, are you passionate about the product? Is it a product that you, you understand? Is it a product you feel strongly about? If you can't answer yes to these two questions, then you shouldn't be doing the deal. And I, I mentioned, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to, you've just got to, you've got to love the deals that you're in. And um, if you don't, if you don't, you will love every deal that you meet in the beginning. Uh, so just recognize that and kind of be patient until you get to that one that really makes sense to start. And again, that really means going back to those filters that you're, you developed in the beginning and setting out a clear thesis for how to, how to do that. Any questions about filtering that I can answer before we move on? You potentially meet deals, you may meet a company several times um, before you, you get to decision. I mean, you're making decisions. In the most cases, now I know the, those of you running accelerators and incubators uh, will have a different process. But you know, as an angel, you may meet a deal once and make a decision. You also may have several meetings over the course of an extended period of time with the founder before you get to a decision. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, recognizing uh, not just the founders' timelines, but also the, just respecting their time, I think, is very important, and, and keeping them up to date on your thinking is very important. I think that's one thing that I've, I've learned in the course of the last year. You know, telling people no when you're not interested is actually really valuable. It's really respected. I've actually gotten, personally, I've actually gotten a lot of interesting introductions from founders I said no to. And I think that's because a lot of people don't say no. And so it's it's an interesting it's an inter it's one data point, but it, but it, but there's like little things you can do to respect the fact that they're giving you time, and time is, is, is something that's very hard for them to give at this early stage. So there are little ways you can build um, your reputation. Okay, so that's how we filter through deals. Okay, so then the final step is is really getting to closing, and um, so you're entering into a contract obviously between you and and the, between the startup and the other investors. Um, there's two ways you can structure it. Um, I'm assuming most of you on the table are familiar, but you could either do equity, which I think is easier. We prefer equity deals, but a lot of a lot of the really early deals would just be convertible notes. You may or may not have a cap on those deals, depending on how early you're getting into a deal. 
The most important thing to do right now is to get a lawyer. Do not try to do this on the cheap. Um, there is absolutely no reason not to spend that money up front because the, you, the, the five to 10 grand that it's going to cost the structure deal correctly today is worth it, it as opposed to the 50 to 100 grand it's gonna cost you if you fucked it up. So there's, excuse my French. <laughs> um, there's, there's just absolutely no reason not to get a lawyer. And, 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 and if, other, if other people are on the table, the founders are saying, oh, we found this way to do it on the cheap, we've got these documents I got off the internet, no. Get a lawyer. And make sure the founders have a lawyer if they don't already. Um, it's just, it, it, is, it is way too expensive not to get a lawyer. And then, um, you know, we actually, uh, so valuation, you know, you'll, you'll discuss that again. Uh, that may not be set by you based on, you based on, you know, especially as an angel, there's, um, you know, there's different, you, you potentially are working with a lead, the lead will put down a term, will put down the term sheet. Um, there will be some key terms that you'll negotiate. The reality is you really, there really shouldn't be a lot of back and forth negotiation, maybe around, around the price of the deal, the pricing of the deal. But we use standard series seed documents at the seed stage. Uh, if you go to seriesseed.com, um, our firm was actually involved in helping to get those documents done. They're very plain, vanilla, standard. The reality is a lot of terms will get renegotiated uh, in later stages of follow-on funding. And so going with a very basic standard document will save you in terms of legal costs. You won't pay exorbitant high legal fees negotiating each individual term. And it's also just standard, and it makes for an easier Series A. You don't want some weird kludgy terms in there that are actually going to get in the way of follow-on investing later on. Um, one other thing I'll just mention right now uh, between doing equity and, and convertible notes, at a certain point in time, depending on how large the deal is getting, you're really going to want to think about getting over, um, converting over to, to equity. Equity, you know, you're getting upwards to two, two million dollars around. You don't want to do that as a convertible note. Um, there's just it, it just makes later stage funding again get a little trickier. So there's a point in time in which I'd say, based on the size of the round, I wouldn't even have the conversation about doing a note. You really want to you really want to try to do that priced round at that point in time. Um, so most of you will not be the lead investors, is my, is my general assumption. And so typically, someone like us are actually uh, negotiating the terms of the deal, um, the prices, and how much allocation you'll get. And so one thing I'll mention in terms of allocation, and this goes back to how do you get into deals in the first place. Um, when it comes time to make tough decisions, hot deals will be oversubscribed. And there will, you know, even, even in down markets, there will still be hot deals. And so how do you make sure you get into the cap table? And how do you make sure you get into the deal in an amount that's meaningful to you? And that's really being able to clearly define that value proposition. Having a founder really go to bat to want you on, in that term. Or having the investors around the table know your value proposition and understanding what you're bringing to the deal. So again, every deal you do is about building that reputation. So what's the value add that you're going to bring? You know, certainly as a later stage fund, or a later stage, excuse me, larger fund at SoftTech, you know, part of our value is that we have, a, we have you know, deeper pockets. And, you know, we, all, we can put more money into companies. In addition to the network that we bring, in addition to the experience of investing in over 140 company, 130 companies. What, what, is, what is the thing that's going to make a firm like ours interested in having you as one of the three to five angels that gets to get into the deal? And so, you know, we certainly, you know, the other investors around the table will have some influence in who makes it into a deal. And the hotter the deal, the more value added you look to really make sure you're, you're building out that syndicate. So I think, again, it really goes back to building that brand. Um, traditionally, most of the heavy due diligence lifting is going to be done by the larger, the larger, the larger checks in the deal. So um, once we put down a term sheet, uh, goes <coughs> to the the the, fa the founders, their lawyers will review. It goes back and forth in a diligence room with our lawyers and their lawyers. They handle most of the the lifting there, um, and then at some point we'll coordinate a closing. Uh, We'll get everybody the wire information. You know, everybody has a date in which we wired the money, and it's it's pretty straightforward. Um, and then finally, you know, you'll obviously you're committing you're committing money to the company. You're potentially committing other resources to the company, and then essentially someone may join the board if a board exists. And again, that that, that could be you as an angel investor, 
um, it, it's generally the larger the larger shareholder that's going in as an investor that's going to join the board. And in many cases, there isn't a board that's formed. Uh, my advice for companies, we talk a little bit about, I don't know how much, so, you know, we're at five now, so. Yeah, um, so we've got a panel, I don't think my have. <laughs> um, I've, we're going to have a panel straight after this. Okay. Okay. So if you guys don't mind waiting a few more minutes so uh, Stephanie can finish the talk, we were running late and I'm really sorry about that. So um, yeah, so um, Say 10 minutes. so we will we will form a you know we will from time to time form a board, but like I think this is a good transition into uh, portfolio management. So if you don't have a board formed um, and you aren't formally meeting, and as angels you may or may not be going, you you most likely will not be part of those board meetings. You may get an update post board meeting. If there is not a board form, I think it's a really good practice to get into having those founders just give some standard uh, timeline communication to all of the investors. It gets all of you on the same page. It allows all of us to know what's going on at the company and then begin to not double down in terms of resources. If I need an intro to you know, three individuals, I don't need three of my investors making intros to the same person. I need three different investors making three different intros. So little things like that. Um, you know, getting into that pattern can be helpful. Board meetings do help provide some of that structure, but early stage companies, when they don't form boards, helping the founders you know, begin to give those updates is important. And I think if they can do it for everybody, it does help streamline things and allows you to focus on adding more value as opposed to just getting an update and then, oh, let me try to add value at the end. Um, so just a bit on portfolio management. Um, so this is an art. It's, it's really about how do you get information without interfering with business. Uh, it's not your company. Um, you can't call up these companies every day, every week. How's my investment doing? <laughs> it, is, it, is it is the absolute worst thing you can start to do, right? You, it, you know, in a sense, you are not the one running the company. You're not, not the one making the decisions around the company. And that can be a very difficult thing, especially if you've been an operator before. You want to jump in and you want to help. You really have to think strategically about how you're going to help and how you're going to give advice to these companies in a way that you're not getting in the way of them actually executing on what they need to do. And remember, you're not the only investor in the deal, most likely. And so imagine if you've got, you know, I don't know, five, ten investors, and every single one of them is pinging you every couple of days, how is this going? What's up with this? When am I, you know, when, when am I going to get, you know, out of, when am I going to get my money back? When am I going to, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. It puts added pressure on the founder. So I think getting to those standardized updates is, is one important way that everybody can be on the same page in the very beginning. But then also really beginning to feel out from each founder, like, what's the appropriate level of contact I need to have with this individual? Do I wait for them to, are they really good at giving me, like, I have some founders in the portfolio that are great at giving me updates. I never have to ask what's going on in the company. I know every two weeks or every three weeks, I'm going to get an email from the founder. It's going to be incredibly detailed. And then I can actually pick the two or three bullet points that are most relevant. And I'll do a follow-up call. I'll even schedule a follow-up call you know, in advance, knowing that I'll get these updates. And we'll spend time diving into those areas where they actually might need help. Or I sh I'll shoot a quick email and say, hey, you need these three things. I'll get take care of those three intros. Let's just be done with this. The less, of, the less time I can spend with them, the more time they're building their businesses to. They don't, they don't have a lot, again, they still don't have a lot of time. Um, and so that, that's one piece. There's other founders I never hear from. Those are probably founders you're gonna wanna pay and, and try to get them on a more frequent update schedule. Um, some people, again, it's just, it's just knowing the personalities. There's some people that are great on email and I have a, you know, I, we, can, we, can get, we can get through things on email and we don't need to pick up the phone. There's other founders that really like getting on the phone and having it and talking through conversations. So it is about figuring out the, the personalities of each of the companies and the founders that you're working with and the best way to work with them. You also may have preferable ways that you work. And so I think letting people know that this is, how, this is the best way to reach me is also helpful. I, um, you know, I tell my founders, I'm, I'm in meetings a good chunk of the day. Um, and I don't check, I check my email, but I don't respond to email necessarily until later in, later in the day. So I always tell my founders, you've got my cell phone, you can call me anytime, day or night, that you need to ask a question if it's important. Because that's the best way to reach me. So if you're super responsive on email and that's the best way to reach you, let them know. So I think, I think it is about figuring out how to communicate and taking a step back as you've done your first deal or your first couple of deals and you look at how that communication is working and you ask yourself, what is it that I can change? How can I communicate better with these, these partners? 
Um, so we talked a little about the, the rules of engagement, how we're gonna how we're gonna do all of this. But I think it's really really helpful. Um, and then finally, I'm just gonna get to this whole slide so that I don't have to read it from afar. <laughs> so just about time, kind of timing. It, it takes 12 to 18 months after angel funding to get to that traditional VC round. I would argue it's taking 18 to 24 months now in the environment that we're in right now. Um, there's just a lot of companies getting seed funding and so the bar is getting higher and higher at the Series A level. So you wanna make sure that there's enough money to get the investment off the ground to really begin to show meaningful traction in later stage. Um, basically, the, the way that you can help them when they go out for funding is helping them with a pitch, practice listening to the pitch. Every company in our portfolio that goes out to pitch, like they come in, they, they give us the pitch internally. In a sense, we're also making decision whether or not we're going to follow on, but really it's a, it's a constructive conversation of going through the pitch, refining the pitch, giving them feedback before they actually formally go out. And then one of the most important things we do is, is we make introductions to VCs. And, 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 you know, dirty little secret, I think everybody knows this though, is that's how deals get done. You know, a really good intro to a VC that we're close with moves to the top of the funnel, right? Same with us. A really good intro from a founder, from someone that we trust, goes to the top of my funnel, and that, that gets to meeting a lot quicker than a, a, a lukewarm intro or definitely anything cold. We've actually never invested in anything cold. In the thousands of deals that we've seen at SoftTech, we have never once invested in a deal that, that did not come through some form of referral or validation. So, you know, and, and every, and, and different investors will have different stories, but, but every single deal we've met has been in some way a referral. Um, and so that, therefore, you know, when you think about sort of that <coughs> round of funding, referral matters. Uh, this one, this one is totally co-opted from Jeff. Stay the fuck out of the way if you've not raised money yourself. Just, just stay out of the way. Let the people that have raised money get involved in helping these companies raise money. You just don't want to intervene if you really don't know what you're doing at that stage. It can be more detrimental. Um, the other thing I'll mention is the intros that you're making for your companies need to be very tight and coordinated. Uh, you should not have five different uh, investors in the syndicate pinging the same VC. I, I, this happens to me actually quite a bit. Um, I'll, I'll have a deal that I get three or four introductions to and Frankly, if people coordinate it, and, and these, in many cases, these are deals that um, aren't funded yet, right? So the founders trying to find 10 different channels to get to me, they, 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 five of them are like, oh yeah, I know Stephanie. <coughs> Not all of them know Stephanie all that well. A lot of, some of them, when I get a referral from someone who was in my you know, business school class, who works in consulting, who I haven't talked to in years, it's not exactly a great referral because they don't work in my industry. They don't know the deal. They don't, you know, so, so I actually really care about the quality of the referral. Um, and if I'm getting five referrals on the same company and they're all relatively weak referrals, then that's, a really, that's actually a pretty bad, bad signal for me. Um, so again, it, as, you, as, your, as your companies and your portfolio are going out to raise, to raise funding, the question is, who are the VCs we want to introduce them to to do their follow-on? And who are the right people in the syndicate that can make the strongest intro? And it does, it's not a bad ego at this point. It's really about what, what can you do to be most effective for the company. If you have the closest tie to the investor, you're the one that makes the intro. Um, if you don't have the closest tie to the investor, like I would step aside and let someone else who does have a stronger tie make that intro because that intro is, is really, really critical. All right, anything else on? Uh, and really the, the lead's job is to really coordinate and lead the fundraising. So if you're going to be making intros, make sure you're checking back with the company and the lead to make sure that you know, you're not overlapping in terms, of, in terms of that. Final point we'll just talk about really briefly is exit. Um, great piece of advice we've been given is good things happen to good companies. So you just need to be patient. If it's a good company, don't worry about what the exit will be. Just continue to let that company grow and evolve and be patient because a good company will have a good outcome. Um, as angels, you're really along to enjoy the ride. You actually have very different sorts of outcomes, um, outcome expectations that we do. You can put, you can invest in a, in a two million pre-deal and it can exit for ten and can have a great outcome. That doesn't work for for us as, as later stage investors. Um, I think I heard the last speaker talk about like the last thing you want to hear is like a founder sit here and say, "This is how I know I'm going to exit." 
I don't want to hear that either. You shouldn't want to hear that either. It, it isn't really about knowing exactly how I'm going to exit this company and get your, re your returns back in, in X number of years. But you do want to know, I think at the end of the day, you know, what, what does the life of this company look like? What are the possible outcomes for this company? But you do need, if it's a good company, again, you want to stay out of the way and allow the company to grow as opposed to really um, breathing down that, that, that uh, founder's neck and wanting to know what's out. And then the final thing to mention is that, you know, depending on how long the company is around, um, there, there definitely come to be opportunities uh, as companies grow to sell s shares in the secondary market, to, to kind of clean up cap tables. And so you do have the option to, to exit some of your earlier investments as they mature into later stage, but yet not, still not yet public companies. Um, to, to, to unload, not unload those shares, but essentially to, to, to get back a solid return for yourselves and be, be a little bit more liquid so again you can put that into more companies. And as you think about a portfolio strategy, that's certainly something that many of you would probably want to do. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna need to finish. Yeah, I'm going to end it right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks everybody.